slow train to Western Peace. It was early June and Peking wore the green lace of spring, its thousands of willows and imperial cypresses, making the forbidden city a place of wonder and enchantment, and in many cool gardens, it was impossible to believe in the China of breaking toil, starvation, revolution, and foreign invasion, that lay beyond the glittering roofs of the palaces. Here well-fed foreigners could live in their own little never-never land of whiskey and soda, polo, tennis, and gossip, happily quite unaware of the pulse of humanity outside the great city's silent, insulating walls, as indeed many did. And yet during the past year, even the oasis of Peking had been invaded by the atmosphere of struggle that hovered over all China. Threats of Japanese conquest had provoked great demonstrations of the people, especially among the enraged youth. A few months earlier I had stood under the bullet-pitted Tartar wall and seen 10,000 students gather, defiant of the gendarmes, club banks, to shout in a mighty chorus, resist Japan, reject the demands of Japanese imperialism for the separation of North China from the South. All Peking's defensive masonry could not prevent reverberations of the Chinese Red Army's sensational attempt to march through Shasta to the Great Wall, ostensibly to begin a war against Japan for recovery of the lost territories. This somewhat quixotic expedition had been promptly blocked by 11 divisions of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's crack new army, but that had not prevented patriotic students from courting imprisonment and possible death by massing in the streets and uttering the forbidden slogans, cease civil war, cooperate with the communists to resist Japan, save China. One midnight I climbed aboard a dilapidated train, feeling a little ill, but in a state of high excitement. Excitement because before me lay a journey of exploration into a land hundreds of years and hundreds of miles removed from the medieval splendors of the Forbidden City, I was bound for Red China. And a little ill because I had taken all the inoculations available. A microbe as I view of my bloodstream would have revealed a macabre cavalcade. My arms and legs were shot with smallpox, typhoid, cholera, typhus, and plague germs. All five diseases were prevalent in the Northwest. Moreover, Alarming reports had lately told of the spread of bubonic plague in Shisa province, one of the few spots on earth where it was endemic. My immediate destination was Xianfu which means, Western Peace. Xianfu was the capital of Shisa province, it was two tiresome days and nights by train to the southwest of Peking, and it was the western terminus of the Lunghai Railway. From there I planned to go northward and enter the Soviet districts, which occupied the very heart of Ta Sipei, China's great northwest. Rochai, a town about 150 miles north of Xianfu, then marked the beginning of Red Territory in Shisa. Everything north of it, except strips of territory along the main highways, and some points which will be noted later, was already dyed red. With Rocha roughly the southern, and the Great Wall the northern, extremities of Red Control in Shisa, both the eastern and western Red frontiers were formed by the Yellow River. Coming down from the fringes of Tibet, the wide, Muddy stream flows northward through Pesu and Ningxia, and above the Great Wall into the province of Suya Inner Mongolia. Then after many miles of uncertain wandering toward the east it turns southward again, to pierce the Great Wall and form the boundary between the provinces of Shisa and Shasa. It was within this great bend of China's most treacherous river that the Soviets then operated, in northern Shisa, northeastern Pesu, and southeastern Ningxia. And by a strange sequence of history this region almost corresponded to the original confines of the birthplace of China. Near here the Chinese first formed and unified themselves as a people, thousands of years ago. In the morning, I inspected my traveling companions, and found a youth and a handsome old man with a wisp of gray beard sitting opposite me, sipping bitter tea. Presently the youth spoke to me, in formalities at first, and then inevitably of politics. I discovered that his wife's uncle was a railway official, and that he was traveling with a pass. He was on his way back to Sichuan, his native province, which he had left seven years before. But he was not sure that he would be able to visit his hometown after all. Bandits were reported to be operating near there. You mean Reds? Oh, no, not Reds, although there are Reds in Sichuan too. No, I mean bandits. But aren't the Reds also bandits? I asked out of curiosity. The newspapers always call them Red Bandits or Communist Bandits. Ah. Uh, but you must know that the editors must call them bandits because they are ordered to do so by Nanking, he explained. If they called them communists or revolutionaries that would prove they were communists themselves. But in Shechuan don't people fear the Reds as much as the bandits? Well, that depends. The rich men fear them, 
and the landlords, and the officials and tax collectors, yes, but the peasants do not fear them, sometimes they welcome them. Then he glanced apprehensively at the old man, who sat listening intently, and yet seeming not to listen. You see, he continued, the peasants are too ignorant to understand that the Reds only want to use them. They think the Reds really mean what they say, but they do not mean it. My father wrote to me that they did abolish usury and opium in the Sungpan Shichun, and that they redistributed the land there. So you see they are not exactly bandits. They have principles, all right. But they are wicked men. They kill too many people. Then surprisingly the graybeard lifted his gentle face and with perfect composure made an astonishing remark. Chapuko. He said. They don't kill enough. We both looked at him flabbergasted. Unfortunately the train was nearing Chengsha, where I had to transfer to the Lunghai line, and I was obliged to break off the discussion. But I have ever since wondered with what deadly evidence this Confucian-looking old gentleman would have supported his startling contention. I wondered about it all the next day of travel, as we climbed slowly through the weird levels of Lois Hills in Honan and Shizu, and until my train this one still new and very comfortable rolled up to the new and handsome railway station at Xianfu. Soon after my arrival, I went to call on General Yang Hucheng, Pacification Commissioner of Shisa Province. Until a couple of years before, General Yang had been undisputed monarch of those parts of Shisa not controlled by the Reds. A former bandit, he rose to authority via the route that had put many of China's ablest leaders in office, and on the same highway he was said to have accumulated the customary fortune. But recently he had been obliged to divide his power with several other gentlemen in the Northwest. For in 1935, the young marshal, Chang Su Liang, who used to be ruler of Manchuria, had brought his Tungpi, Manchurian, army into Shisu, and assumed office in Xianfu as supreme red chaser in these parts, vice commander of the National Bandit Suppression Commission. And to watch the young marshal had come Xiao Li Tu, an acolyte of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, the Han. Xiao was governor of Shisu. A delicate balance of power was maintained between these figures, and still others. Tugging strings behind all of them was the redoubtable Generalissimo himself, who sought to extend his dictatorship to the northwest, and liquidate not only the communist, led revolution but also the troops of old Yang Hu Cheng and Yang Cheng Su Liang. By the simple process of using each to destroy the other, three acts of a brilliant politico, military drama the main stratagem of which Cheng evidently believed was understood only by himself. And it was that error in calculation, a little too much haste in pursuit of the purpose, a little too much confidence in his adversary's stupidity, which was in a few months to land Chiang Kai-shek a prisoner in Xianfu, at the mercy of all three. I found General Yang, in a newly finished stone mansion, just completed at a cost of $50,000. He was living in this many-chambered vault the official home of the pacification commissioner without a wife. Yang Hu C.H. Ching, like many Chinese in this transitional period, was burdened with domestic infelicity, for he was a two-wife man. The first was the lily-footed wife of his youth, betrothed to him by his parents in Puchum, the second, as vivacious and courageous a woman as Madame. Chiang Kai-shek was a pretty young mother of five children, modern and progressive, a former communist, they said, and the girl that Yang had chosen himself. It seemed, according to the missionaries, that when he opened his new home each of his wives had presented him with the same minimum demand. Each detested the other, each had borne him sons and had the right to be legal wife and each resolutely refused to move into the stone mansion unless the other stayed behind. To an outsider the case looked simple, a divorce or a third wife was the obvious solution. But General Yang had not made up his mind and so he still lived alone. His dilemma was a not uncommon one in modern China. Chiang Kai-shek had faced a similar issue when he married rich, American-educated Su Mei Ling, who as a Methodist was not prepared to accept polygamy. Chiang had finally divorced his first wife, the mother of his son Ching Kuo, and pensioned off his two concubines. The decision was highly approved by the missionaries, who had ever since prayed for his soul. Nevertheless, this way out a newfangled idea imported from the West was still frowned upon by many Chinese. Old Yang, having risen from the people, was probably less concerned over the disposal of his soul than the traditions of his ancestors. And it must not be supposed that Yang's early career as a bandit necessarily disqualified him as a leader. Such assumptions could not be made in China, where a career of banditry in early youth often indicated a man of strong character and purpose. 
A look at Chinese history showed that some of China's ablest patriots were at one time or another labeled bandits. The fact was that many of the worst rogues, scoundrels, and traitors had climbed to power under cover of respectability, the putrid hypocrisy of Confucian maxims, and the priestcraft of the Chinese classics, though they had very often utilized the good strong arm of an honest bandit in doing so. General Yang's history as a revolutionary suggested a rugged peasant who might once have had high dreams of making a big change in his world, but who, finding himself in power, looked vainly for a method, and grew weary and confused, listening to the advice of the mercenaries who gathered around him. But if he had such dreams he did not confide them to me. He declined to discuss political questions, and courteously delegated one of his secretaries to show me the city. He was also suffering from a severe headache and rheumatism when I saw him, and in the midst of his sea of troubles I was not one to insist upon asking him nettling questions. On the contrary, in his dilemma he had all my sympathy. So after a brief interview with him I discreetly retired, to seek some answers from the Honorable Governor, Shali Tu. Governor Xia received me in the garden of his spacious Emma, cool and restful after the parching heat of Shen's dusty streets. I had last seen him six years before when he was Chiang Kai-shek's personal secretary, and at that time he had assisted me in an interview with the Generalissimo. Since then he had risen rapidly in the Kuomintang. He was an able man, well-educated, and the Generalissimo had now bestowed upon him the honors of a governorship. But poor Xiao, like many another civil governor, did not rule much beyond the provincial capital's gray walls the outlying territory being divided by General Yang and the young marshal. After 1927 it had become very clear what it meant and one could have one's head removed for it. Xia then became a devout Buddhist, and subsequently displayed no further signs of heresy. He was one of the most charming gentlemen in China. How are the Reds getting along? I asked him. There are not many left. Those in Shinsa are only remnants. Then the war continues. I asked. No, at present there is little fighting in North Shinsa. The Reds are moving into Ningxia and Hassel. They seem to want to connect with Outer Mongolia. He shifted the conversation to the situation in the southwest, where insurgent generals were then demanding an anti-Japanese expedition. I asked him whether he thought China should fight Japan. Can we? He demanded. And then the Buddhist governor told me exactly what he thought about Japan not for publication just as every Kuomintang official would then tell you his opinion of Japan not for publication. A few months after this interview poor Xiao was to be put on the spot on this question of war with Japan along with his generalissimo by some rebellious young men of Marshal Chang Su Liang's army, who refused to be reasonable and take, maybe someday, for an answer any longer. And Xiao's diminutive wife a returned student from Moscow and a former communist herself was to be cornered by some of the insurrectionists and make a plucky fight to resist arrest. But Xiao revealed no premonition of all this in our talk, and an exchange of views having brought us perilously near agreement, it was time to leave. I had already learned from Shaoli too what I wanted to know. He had confirmed the word of my Peking informant, that fighting had temporarily halted in North Shisa, therefore it should be possible to go to the front, if properly arranged. 